All right, so in this video, I want to talk about Algorand. And Algorand is a cryptocurrency that has um, the user BFT uh, algorithm for consensus. If you don't really know what BFT is, it's not a prerequisite for to watch this video, but uh, it, it's kind of useful to understand uh, its limitation or how it works uh, to some degree to, to understand what I, I'll talk about, but don't worry too much otherwise. Um, BFT is just a consensus algorithm that uh, um, the, the concept was invented a long time ago, but but pretty much the, the, the famous uh, BFT algorithm is PBFT and all, uh, all of the other BFT algorithms are usually variants of, of PBFT and um, they usually don't scale too well. So, so if you have a few uh, dozens, hundreds maybe in some variants or, or thousands of participants, maybe it can work, but uh, it's, it's hard to scale. And in a permissionless setting where you want every everybody on the blockchain, uh, on the cryptocurrency to be able to participate in that consensus mechanism, then uh, it becomes somewhat tricky. So uh, one way of, of trying to make it work is to limit the number of participants is, and to kind of randomly choosing your participants uh, during each round. Um, and, and Algorand goes a, a bit further. Actually, uh, every round has different steps uh, and, and different steps will have different partic partic participants uh, participating in, in that um, step or, or phase or whatever. Um, so you, you, you have ways of, of calculating who's going to be the next uh, leader or who are going to be the next participants for some round or, or for some steps. Uh, but if you, if, if you do that, then you have another issue. And that is, um, you, you already know in advance who's going to be uh, participating. And so you can target them and maybe corrupt them or steal their keys or, or do a denial of service attack on them uh, and so on. So, so you have these issues. Um, so Algorand came up with something called, uh, I believe, cryptographic uh, sortition. And uh, it's a, a very cool arg algorithm or protocol that allows um, uh, kind of last minute selection of participants uh, and it th is thus not a, a vulnerable to that kind of attack. So in this video, I'll, I'll pretty much explain how this crypto uh, sortition works uh, from, from a high level point of view. It's possible that the details are, are somewhat incorrect. Uh, Algorand might change some things uh, from the time the video is made to, to um, I don't know, the future. Uh, and, and this is mostly taken from, from uh, one of their papers, so it's possible that something a bit different is, is running in, in, in prod right now, um, but the IDs are there. Um, so before I can explain how that works, I actually have to explain how uh, VRF works, because they make heavy use of VRF, and a VRF is pretty much a verifiable random uh, function. And uh, that's kind of a weird thing, but imagine a PRNG that produces uh, random numbers. Um, a VRF is something like that, but uh, there is a secret key involved. involved. Uh, and you can also, uh, uh, there's also a proof uh, that is generated when it generates random numbers for public consumption, not for private consumption. Uh, and we'll see more about that. Uh, and there is a proof that you can use to verify that the random number uh, that this VRF generated are correct. So, so usually this is the API. I'm gonna spell it out, secret key. And, and, and actually you need a seed, a public seed. Uh, that's important later for verification. And it uh, produces, uh, let's say a random number uh, and a proof. All right, this is what a VRF pretty much produces. Uh, all of a secret key, which can be a user secret key or some some other secret key and some public seed. And then you have a verification algorithm uh, that takes uh, the random number that was generated, okay, or the uh, VRF output. It also takes uh, the public key. And then it uses the proof and the seed, so the public seed and and this returns true or false, right? Uh, and true is returned pretty much if uh, the, the random number was generated correctly from the secret key associated with the public key and from that seed. So, all right, so 
this is kind of an abstract concept uh, and throughout this video you'll understand how this can be useful in practice all right um, but also give you an intuition how this is uh, this can work um, and, and there's a very simple way to implement that and uh, this is with signatures imagine that you're signing uh, with your secret key uh, a seed all right your message is a seed and it produces a signature well uh, you're almost a signature is almost uh, like a random number it's it's pretty random except that it's usually biased uh, you will have some bits that are biased uh, so what you want to do is to take the hash of the signature uh, if you have a good hash function this will randomize uh, uniformly spread uh, bytes of your signature to something truly random uh, and you can use that as your random number all right and now to verify uh, pretty much use the signature verification function, right? How do you verify a signature? You use a public key. You use uh, the message, so here's the seed, and you use a signature, right? And this returns true or false. Um, and so to to verify, you, you do need the signature in addition to the random number uh, produced by the hash. Uh, and with the public key and the seed, uh, you can you can verify that the random number was generated correctly. Uh, as a note, most signature algorithm actually don't allow this, this very naive uh, implementation of a VRF because uh, with most signature algorithm you can create uh, different signatures for the same seed and for the same secret key that will verify um, under the, the public key uh, and, and this, is, this is bad because if you have the secret key then you can generate different random numbers uh, depending on, on your the different signatures that you can generate. Uh, this is not true for all uh, signature schemes. For example, BLS produces uh, unique signatures, but for most other signature schemes, this is an issue, so it's a bit more involved to implement a VRF. All right, so now that you know how a VRF work, I want to um, try and, and, and explain what's the kind of the, the main idea behind uh, this uh, cryptographic sortition. And the main idea is that when a round starts, or, or a bit before a round starts, um, every user is going to calculate the VRF uh, of, uh, the, with their secret key, all right? So that's something they can calculate uh, individually. They don't, they don't need anything else. And they're gonna take a seed, which is some information uh, that have appeared in some previous blocks. I'm not gonna to talk too much about that, but it's public. Uh, and they're gonna use also the round and the step or something like that. Uh, to produce uh, some some random number that, that actually I'll call VRF uh, outputs and some uh, proof and this is pretty much their lottery ticket and the main idea is that if they look at that and they realize that this VRF output is smaller than some some number some threshold then they win and then they can publish uh, the VRF output, the proof, and then uh, people can verify that and they can take par part in the protocol. Uh, the way this X is calculated uh, is just uh, uh, large enough so that you have uh, enough participants and small enough so that you don't have too many participants. Uh, there is a bit more subtlety. You don't want just uh, one person on average, for example, uh, because that means that sometimes you won't have any winner uh, and, and so for some rounds, you, you, you won't be able to make progress. Um, and, and if that number is too small, you might also only have uh, away from keyboard winners. Uh, so, so you don't make any progress as well. But if this number is, and, and at some, some threshold, you also are not too sure about the number of Byzantine um, uh, participants. So you really don't want, you want a number large enough that you have enough honest participants, but, but too large is, is also uh, not efficient. So you have this kind of, um, uh, you, you have to choose X carefully here, but, but I won't talk about it too much. Uh, another thing that is, that is interesting uh, is that in some step of the BFT protocol uh, that uh, Algorand use, or that pretty much any BFT protocol use, uh, or, or leader-based BFT protocol use, is that you have a leader that will make a proposal uh, and if you have several leaders which will happen uh, here 
because you cannot limit uh, that to exactly one person. If you have several leaders in that proposal phase, then you don't know who to vote for in the next proposal, in the next phase, right? You have several proposals with different blocks and different transactions. Who do you vote for? Um, the trick here is just to take the hash of the VRF outputs um, uh, of of the of the of each um, leaders and just to take the biggest one and prioritize that and just vote on that. So you you have to wait a bit to 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 get some amount of uh, proposals from leaders and then you choose the 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 main leader the correct leader based on the hash of their VRF output. You want the biggest one. So a very simple trick, right? All right. So. One thing I want to talk about, because we're not finished yet, is that uh, CBIL attacks are a problem here. And remember I said that uh, we're trying to find a way for every user to participate in the consensus protocol, but what is a user here? And a user is usually maybe a public key on a, in a cryptocurrency, right? And uh, you can quickly imagine that, it, just for the sake of trying to think about it, uh, if there is no uh, transaction fees in a cryptocurrency, then you can pretty much create one account per one coin, right? And so this gives you an advantage. You have pretty much as many accounts or as many lottery tickets as you have coins. And if the others don't do that, then you pretty much uh, have more chances to get picked up to, to participate in the consensus. So what Argon does is that they make this a feature and it pretty much um, give you as many lottery tickets as coins you have. So we have to modify the protocol that we've seen earlier in order to understand how it works. So imagine that you want to create different buckets, one for zero winning uh, lottery tickets. Okay. Uh, one bucket for one lottery, winning lottery tickets, another bucket for two lo winning lottery tickets, and on and on, until something that is, um, and we say that you have W coins, right? W winning, exactly W winning lottery tickets. All right, you have this W plus one buckets. And now imagine that you have a ball, and your ball is actually your VRF output. And pretty much uh, when you get a VRF output, it's a pretty big number. You transform that uh, into a way that it's it's pretty much like it's dropping in one of these buckets. So you don't know which bucket is going to fall in, but whatever buckets it falls in uh, tells you how many winning lottery tickets you have. All right, that's, that's kind of the general idea. Now uh, you have several winning lottery tickets. Remember, it's still a problem uh, because in the proposal phase uh, we don't know who is the real uh, leader right so the way the, the, they fix this is to this time take the hash of your VRF output uh, as well as uh, the number of uh, lottery tickets so pretty much you're going to, to generate that with zero the first time uh, and then you generate the same thing with one and so on until uh, imagine that you have J, uh, J uh, winning tickets, okay? Imagine that this is what you got somewhere, somewhere here, right? Imagine that this is what you got. So you, you compute all of this hash and you take the biggest value and this is what you publish. And everybody does that and pretty much uh, the, the true leader or during the proposal uh, uh, phase or step is the one that produces the biggest uh, such number. All right, so for every winning tickets you have, you, you compute uh, one of these uh, hashes. Cool. So that, that's kind of the idea, but how does, it, how does this thing work here? So first to understand that, uh, you have to understand how to calculate uh, the probability that you have X winning lottery tickets out of W lottery tickets. And this is uh, actually very easy to calculate. Uh, you just use Bernoulli uh, trials, uh, which is B. And if you want uh, K, exactly K winning lottery tickets out of W uh, winning 
tickets, right? Out of W tickets, uh, and you have the probability P probability that a ticket is a winner, that uh, a ticket is a winning ticket. All right. This gives you pretty much the size of, of any of these buckets. Uh, and as you saw, uh, uh, it, it goes from increasing, of, uh, it, it's, it gets from smaller to smaller to small buckets until we reach this W winning lottery tickets, which, which makes sense, right? It's easier to lose than to get um, uh, that that to have all your lottery tickets be winners, right? So this this value uh, is is simply uh, k out of w uh, p k and uh, the reverse of p um, w minus k, right? If you're not convinced about that, I can take an example. Uh, let's say that I, I want to know um, out of four tickets. Uh, let's say if I have two, two, two winner tickets out of four tickets, what is the probability? Two winner out of four, right? What's my probability? It's uh, two out of four, P to the two, and uh, whoops, one minus P, uh, four minus two, which is two, all right? And you can calculate that. Uh, calculate this which is um, uh, yeah 6 p square 1 minus p square right and if we do it manually right two win two winning tickets out of four if we do it manually what what are the different possibilities we have uh, winning winning losing losing right our first two tickets wins and the uh, second other tickets uh, lose I have winning lose, winning, lose, or winning, lose, lose, winning. You can also start with the first ticket is a loser. You have to win and one lose, or two losers to win, or uh, uh, what else? Win, lose, win, right? And I think I exhausted them. And uh, all, of, all of these things are always two wins and two uh, loss, right? So you have how many of them? You have, you have six of them. And so indeed, this is what the formula finds. So we know how to calculate the probability that you have X winning tickets out of W tickets. And this tells us pretty much how to compute these boxes, uh, the size of these boxes. And we're gonna see actually all of these, uh, not boxes, but buckets as a long line that goes from zero to one. And the, transform the transformation from, uh, from these probabilities that we've seen here and, um, and, and these buckets that we want to transform into a long line from zero to one um, is due to this very uh, simple concept that uh, if you take the sum of all these buckets, um, whoop, right, of all these probabilities, of course, you're gonna have uh, one because uh, it's a partition of the probability space where you have a zero chance of winning, one chance of winning, two chance of winning, on and on, uh, and you have another probability which is um, double your chance of winning, right? This represents the entire uh, space of possibilities. So since we know that, we can easily calculate uh, what is the range, the first range for uh, our zero winning buckets, and that is pretty much B uh, zero W where does the the bucket stops here at one well uh, easy it's b zero w p plus b one w p right and you can do that on and on until the the very last value here which will be uh, the sum the, the sum that we had of all of these uh, these things which is indeed equal to one all right so this is how you're 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 creating your buckets on uh, on this line that goes from zero to one now uh, what about your ball well uh, it's it's very easy you take your vrf outputs 
and you see this uh, as a as a number from zero to one as well. Uh, and the way you do that is that you you just pretend it's a it, the VRF output. This this big number is just a, the decimal after zero. So if your VRF output is I don't know zero zero ff let's say, um, what 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 your number will be is it's like you you take this number as a decimal, and it will be always uh, smaller than one, right? So zero 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 zero. If we have a four uh, four a uh, two bytes hash, sorry, VRF output, uh, it will go from zero 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 to uh, up to ff ff, right? Which is uh, small smaller than than one. If we we see that as a decimal, so it goes from zero to to one. Cool. So we also know that this number, uh, all of these bits, have equal chance of uh, being set to any uh, value, and so we know that this ball is going to end up uh, in any range, any of these points, with uh, pre pretty much equal probability. So we have a ball that will fall in any of these ranges with equal probability, and now we have uh, our ranges, which are pretty much our buckets. And this is pretty much how that works. So that, that might not have been the, the simplest explanation. Uh, so if, if you have questions, just uh, post a comment under that video, but, but I hope it can help. Uh, and maybe you, you can also take a look at the, the algorithm white paper to, to get more information.